Okay, uh, good evening. Welcome once again to uh, another live stream. Saturday night at 9pm. I know um, people have got other places to be, but thank you all for, for sitting and uh, tuning in. Uh, we are going to look at uh, sort of bonsai display today. Uh, I sort of mentioned it in the emails going out to, to all the donors and things like that and on the um, links on Facebook and what have you. Uh, it's not really going to be a kind of um, uh, like a how-to per se. Uh, it's just really kind of an idea of how uh, the Japanese kind of model uh, has come into being, a little bit of the history, um, some of the ideas behind it um, and kind of like the difference between um, kind of like exhibition style and things like uh, the tokonoma type displays that you may have seen. So that's kind of like what it's going to be. Uh, if you're expecting me to sort of go through um, kind of like displays and say, okay, you do this and you do that and da, 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 and you have to do this and then it's good, then you're going to be a bit disappointed. Or if I'm going to go and sort of critique loads of displays and things like that, I can do that in another stream, but that's not what this is about. This is about kind of like how the sort of the display aesthetics that the, the Japanese practice today uh, have come about rather than anything else so if you if that's what you're looking for then you know stay watching uh the only thing i really have to say um thank you to uh, what uh, the chat questions in the chat as per usual uh i'll try and answer them obviously it's going to be a, another sort of powerpoint thing so we're going to be um my little face will be up in the top uh corner and um uh the PowerPoint presentation will be going on. So it'll be similar to, to a previous one. There we go. Uh, the other the other thing is today is um, July the 4th, I think, uh, which is a really important day um, for, for a lot of people. Um, it's the, the day that um, independence is gained. Uh, we can all go down the pub. Uh, so happy 4th of July to, to everybody who's been down for a pint uh, in the pubs uh, and to all of the, the traitors over in America. Happy 4th. I'm joking, of course. I love America. Um, so, without further ado, because this is a quite actually a, a long uh, sort of thing, we'll we'll um, we'll flip over to that and um, we'll crack on. So, without further ado, here we go. Right. So, uh, as I said, the, uh, the the talk that we're going to do is uh, going to cover a lot of these these different topics. Uh, so, like sort of the difference between art and craft with bonsai uh, and bonsai display. Uh, history of display in Japan, why we why people display it, uh, aesthetics and things like that. So there's going to be um, a lot of sort of different topics that we're going to go through, um, and sort of, sort of talk about them as we go through. But we're going to start with something very very simple, uh, uh, and that's just kind of like look at what bonsai is, because a lot of people sort of do tend to forget um, the kind of the artistic aspects of bonsai, uh, and so when we look at when we're looking at them as um, uh, you know more than just a, a, a living plant so you know when we break down the the, the, the characters in uh, in the word bonsai the first character uh, which we have here uh, is uh, you know, basically the part of the container the second one is uh, you know the, the plant itself and what differentiates bonsai from just simple potted plants is that artistic influence so people putting uh, design into it and uh, there's no place that that becomes much more apparent when bonsai is when we actually sort of come to display it and so when we're sort of thinking about bonsai uh, and kind of like why we practice it why we create it um you know thinking about why we display it is a very important aspect of that and there are lots of reasons why people do bonsai and why people put them on display and we'll sort of go through uh, each of those uh, just just having a sort of a, a brief look at them but one of the big things for a lot of people is this kind of idea of a, a reflection of nature uh, and so this is coming very much into kind of like the western bonsai practice um, at the moment uh, you know this, this idea of trying to find uh, a European voice or an American voice you know and representing the landscapes around us uh, and so when we sort of see Japanese images of bonsai don't necessarily kind of like chime with um, us as Westerners, as Northern Europeans, as British people, as Irish people, as Americans, as West Coast Americans, as East Coast Americans. It doesn't necessarily chime with the, the images that we sort of see around. Uh, and so, you know, some of the reasons why people do bonsai is to, is to reflect the, the landscape around them. I do want to say at this point that I'm not saying that one form of bonsai or display or anything is better than the other this is just a, just a simple sort of presentation of 
uh, kind of the, the history, the facts, and everything as I as I know it, rather than sort of passing judgment on anything. Okay. And so, you know, the the, the concept of uh, um, sort of design aesthetics and display aesthetics will obviously sort of differ from for, for different people. And the reason why uh, sort of bonsai came into being for for the Chinese and then uh, for, for for the Japanese. Uh, is the idea of kind of like looking to represent nature. Um, historically, a lot of the, uh, as we sort of looked at in the um, in the Shohin stream uh, with Matsudaira, who carried trees from his location, from his from his home area, with him to Tokyo as a reminder of um, his his home. Uh, and for a lot of the scholars in ancient China, and then subsequently in like the Edo period in Japan, so it's like. It was, uh, you know, images of, of, of the landscape around them to inspire them for their paintings, for uh, poetry and things like that. Uh, for the aristocrats in early uh, sort of Japanese history, um, kind of like the Muromachi period, like the 1200s, 1300s, and things like that, where they were sort of living within confines. You know, they, they never left their, their kind of like compounds. So, you know, it was uh, representations of, of nature that uh, enabled them to, to kind of move outside the, the you know the boundaries of their four walls or you know the, or the, the compound so to speak and so this this idea of a representation of nature is something that's, that's been very much uh, a part of bonsai uh, from its kind of inception and so when we look at doing it for, for for the um for display as well this is a this is a strong idea that comes into being uh in addition to this there's the the respect for nature as well anybody who does bonsai should should have a deep respect uh, for the trees that they're working on. Uh, the trees are venerated, they're objects of affection, they're treated with love. Uh, and as a result, they want to be shown off. They want to be uh, put on a special place to be appreciated to a, to a greater extent than just having them outside on the benches. And so the act of display is, is, a, is a way of showing respect um, for, for the trees and for nature in general. Uh, and this this idea of respect can um, take on sort of different concepts within the like the natural world. And so, for example, one of the things that we see here is a, a very famous juniper uh, that we see here. Uh, and one of the reasons why junipers are have become so si uh, highly prized is this kind of uh, slightly deeper, more sort of philosophical um, concept. You know, this this, this highlighting the the relationship between life and death. Uh, and so by putting them out on display and sort of considering them, putting them in a, in a special place uh, enables us to, to kind of like um, focus on that, um, that aspect of the, of, of the bonsai. But it doesn't always have to be sort of deep and, uh, and highly spiritual and things like that. So, you know, it can be about sort of um, vitality in your life. And there's a couple of examples of that. Uh, but this tree here, I uh, mentioned this very famous tree. This is a, a tree called Fudo. Uh, and was one of the most uh, famous uh, collected junipers in all of Japan. Uh, there's some history about it on the internet, um, a few different places. So if you kind of like, you know, put in Fudo, Bonsai, Juniper, uh, Google it, you'll come up with a few pages that are about it. And there's a bit more detail, so I won't go into too much. Uh, but it was a real famous uh, tree. It was collected in the, the early 20th century uh, when basically juniper collecting, um, you know, Yamadori was uh, basically kind of being practiced and, and perfected um, and it went through a number of um, kind of hands by various different collectors and it ended up uh, being owned by uh, Kyuzo Murata who was a very famous uh, bonsai artist, uh, Kyukaien which is one of the most kind of uh, influential, uh, the Murata family in the 60s particularly uh, were very influential with kind of the pushing the direction of uh, of bonsai and uh, he decided to, to send it to, uh, at that time, uh, there was a lot of kind of interest uh, in America and they were looking at sending trees over to America in order to try and spread the word of bonsai and to, to have um, very kind of like powerful and impressive uh, specimens over in America. Uh, and he decided to, to send that tree uh, in the sort of the 1969-70s and things like that. And at the time, what they were doing with the importation, they were bare rooting them and giving them these like... Uh, insecticide baths you know sterilizing them basically uh, and so this tree basically got absolutely fried um, and a lot of the trees that got sent in uh, during that time uh, suffered quite badly 
uh, and, and sadly it died sort of soon after. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to see the tree. Uh, I went with Mr. This is, uh, Mr. Morimai, Mr. Seiji Morimai, who is a very well-known bonsai authority in, in Japan. Uh, and we had the opportunity to, to kind of go and uh, he wanted to pay his respect. We, we took a trip specifically to, to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens uh, to, to go and see it. And so that kind of idea of the, the, the respect for um, for the trees uh, carries on in, in the case of some of them uh, until after they're, they're dead. Um, but as I say, it doesn't all necessarily need to be about kind of like, you know, that deep and kind of quite um, depressing nature of the, you know, sort of thinking about life and death at times. Uh, some aspects of bonsai uh, and a display uh, can be um, very much sort of centered around, you know, the, the spring new life, younger trees. There's no reason why all the trees ha that get put on display have to be these old ancient trees as well. There is uh, definite areas of, of a bonsai display where youthful trees uh, and new life can, can be put on display. Uh, another um, reason why bonsai sort of display and the kind of the act of displaying and uh, putting the trees out there for, for people to view, because a lot of people don't necessarily want to put their trees out um, for for public consumption, uh, but what it does and what the the kind of the act of putting trees into exhibitions uh, it does is it enables us to to have a kind of a, a living history. Uh, this is a very famous tree. It's called Higurashi. This is a white pine, uh, which has a you know, a photographic history basically dating back to, to when photographs were first being uh, sort of taken of, of trees, uh, and had been flipped from front to to back a couple of times. Uh, this was the tree after it had been um, sort of restyled by uh, Mr. Yamada uh, in order to kind of like make it. You can actually sort of see on the branch there, there's a, some raffia. Uh, he bent some of the branches around uh, in order to, to kind of really make it a, a double um, sided tree. Uh, and this is the tree as it is now. Uh, and so without the uh, the previous owner, without the previous owner sort of putting it into an exhibition, this is where that photograph is from. This is from um, one of the Kokofu uh, pictures. You wouldn't necessarily have that um, ancient history uh, for the tree. Okay, so other reasons for for, for creating displays uh, for for some people, uh, we're looking at you know some of you out there are just hobbyists, just enjoy sort of putting them there, you know, playing around with the trees in your garden. All you want to know is you know um, when to defoliate, when to do this, when to do that, how to wire and things like that. Um, but even a sort of a hobbyist level when you're kind of like looking at the designing of trees the actual kind of act of display and, and putting them out on on display and considering them as an art form uh, is a very kind of intrinsic part of the design process some people are looking at trying to um, take it to uh, a more serious artistic level um, but one of the things that kind of bonsai does kind of it does sort of suffer from is like how much we can actually sort of hope to achieve with our with our sort of displays, um, because obviously we're working with um, trees uh, and plants as the the medium, uh, and there is only a certain amount of um, there's, there's only certain things that you can do with that uh, in terms of sort of representing uh, sort of natural landscapes and such like. Um, so everything that we do with bonsai is going to have some sort of link with nature. Okay. Uh, but really, the the whole point of of putting on um, a display uh, when you're sort of putting a tree out on display and taking it off of the bench and putting it wherever you're going to put it, either in a, an exhibition uh, or just somewhere in your own home, is to create a relationship between uh, yourself as the person who's looking after the tree, the tree itself, uh, and then the viewers, whoever that may be. Uh, it could just be you and the tree. Uh, where it could be 6,000 people in a hall in Belgium. Uh, but what you're trying to do with the, the act of display is to, to, to convey a message from yourself as an artist, as a, or not necessarily as an artist, but as a practitioner of bonsai to the viewers. And that, that message could be varied. Okay. Um, and really, the, 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 kind of the, the only thing that really defines people who are... The, Kind of doing it as a hobby, and those people who are uh, exhibiting at the the highest level, uh, when it sort of comes to, to to kind of the 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 actual displaying 
and the, the aesthetics of it. Maybe not the, the quality of the tree, it's just the amount of effort that people put in. And so when you go to those higher levels of, of exhibitions, so the Kokofu in Japan or the, the Trophy, Salyu, uh, the National in, in the United States, what you're looking at there is just the, the people that are putting those trees in, it's just putting an incredible amount of effort into, into the preparation of the, of the trees. When you look at the, the kind of the club level shows, and this isn't to diss them, it's just saying that the, the you know those sort of different levels of um, of effort basically, uh, you, you know you you'll see, um, and I, I do go on to talk about this later, but uh, you'll sort of see the you know some people just not bothering to to clean the trees and stuff like that. So that's that's basically kind of like what I'm meaning. Okay. Other reasons for putting trees on display. Uh, you may have seen some pictures like this. Uh, that kind of looks like a, a bit of a strange uh, sort of type of, of aesthetic display to put on. But basically, this is a, uh, a sale. You know, people put trees on 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 display, uh, particularly in bonsai nurseries and bonsai gardens. Uh, this is something that I had to do uh, as an apprentice to Mr. Kobayashi. We used to have to put on um, if we knew a customer was coming, it was looking for a particular tree. Uh, we would make sure that those types of trees were displayed in prominent places within the within the nursery uh in the tokonomas in in the in the customer area and things like that so there is a business aspect to some of the displays that you may sort of see uh other reasons for for, for displaying trees and this is something uh very much on a um a uh kind of a personal level um and this is where kind of uh, the, the the active display can be done in your own home as i was saying you know the, the the ideas and the concepts of display don't necessarily need to be applied to you know, large scale exhibitions and conventions, things like that. It can just be creating a space within your own home uh, to um, to create some displays and enjoy bonsai as an art form rather than having them just out on the bench. I had to do a, I was asked by Bonsai Esprit to take some uh, a photograph of a display uh, inspired by the, the lockdown. Um, and hopefully that's going to be coming out in their magazine in the next issue. Um, but it's a, an interesting kind of playful. Um, so I don't want to put it up here. You know, eventually it'll come out on social media and what have you. Uh, but it's kind of an interesting sort of playful way of involving bonsai in your everyday life, bringing it inside the house, taking it off of the bench and things like that. Uh, and sometimes you know this is uh, a form of escapism. Uh, this is a a, um, a picture taken from a book. Um, from the from the sort of sixties of this um, this gentleman uh, just enjoying his tree, he's just lying there uh, in his home um, uh, and basically just kind of looking at the tree. It's what it says. Okay, and this type of escapism, this type of fun type of display, can be uh, you know just kind of like enjoyable fruits and flowers and, and things like that, rather than these these kind of like um, sort of real powerful uh, Jin and Shara type trees. Uh, and so this is where you can kind of like when you're out of that. You know, the confines of a an exhibition type uh, environment, going to something that's a little bit more playful, uh, and just kind of experiment and have some fun. Uh, this is uh, the sorry that picture was uh, from an exhibition that I did in um, 2013. Uh, this is uh, we saw this in uh, the Shohin stream, uh, and as I said it, during that stream, you know Shohin is one of those um, areas where the display of Shohin can l give you a lot more kind of like freedom for for the enjoyment. Okay, so you know, a little bit more sort of playful. So we talked about bonsai as an art form, um, and when you sort of try to, like, for example, I when I talked about the, the the exhibition that I put on, and if you ever try to kind of approach um, bodies to try and uh, get funding for for exhibitions and things like that, uh, if you approach the the Arts Council, for example, in the UK, uh, they would tell you to go and speak to Horticultural, you know, the the RHS, go and speak to the RHS. You go and speak to the RHS or Q, for example, and they're not interested because it's just an extreme form of gardening to them. There's no kind of real um, kind of like interest uh, for that. If you went to a, a craft body, they would look at you and say, "There's there's no kind of craftsmanship here," sort of thing. And so it, bonsai naturally, because of its because of its nature, falls between all of these sort of um, these these different uh, categories. Um, and you kind of like, you know, back in the day, uh, and even today, there are a lot of people sort of 
you know, sort of going on about, you know, the artistry and bonsai, particularly if you look at the, the sort of the Japanese model and, and the Japanese aesthetics and how the, those trees kind of like get styled, and the artist statement and things like that. Uh, when you're looking at it through sort of the Japanese perspective, it's, it's slightly different than it is from a Western perspective, and um, it's important to have all of these. Um, these ideas uh, in your head when you're you're kind of like approaching bonsai, you know, it really is. Um, you need to be um, looking at mastering both the technique, the artistry, and the horticulture of of, of bonsai in order to, to really sort of take a tree to to the highest level. Um, and when we're making a tree, you need the technique and craftsman chip in order to kind of like apply the wire. In order to, to be able to kind of uh, perform repotting techniques properly uh, and things like that, but then when it's sort of coming to, to the design aspect of it, you need the eye of an artist. Uh, and one thing that you tend to see with people who who don't put their trees on on display is um, less of that artistry, less of a, of, a, of a sound understanding of how important it is, for example, to put direction within a tree, to to consider space within a tree to consider how it may be displayed how it may be perceived as an artistic object uh, and you'll sort of see a lot of technically perfect trees um, that have been made where the, the person has just been sort of focusing on the wiring the creation of foliage pads to these this you know this perfection thing but when it actually sort of comes to display the the display aesthetic it's very very sort of uh, or putting it on display in an exhibition becomes uh, very very difficult and i remember saying to to, to, to ryan one time and this is a very sort of uh, sort of superficial um, way of looking at it and people may disagree but it's just kind of a to to kind of hammer across the point that the artistic side of it really does come from the the, the, the display aspect of it it's like you know it only becomes art when you actually then put it out there for for people to to look at and consider it as an artistic piece when it's just sat on your benches in and amongst all these other trees is it really a piece of art is it really a work of art then or is it a work of craft is it a work of horticultural uh, proficiency okay so we talked about i mentioned about the the kind of the act of display uh, and all of these things and this kind of like this intentionality um, between bef uh, behind kind of putting things on display so when we're putting our trees out on display for others to look at you know there's a there's a lot of reasons for for doing it one of the reasons for the majority of people uh is sort of sharing with the world the beauty of bonsai particularly your tree um or allowing people to see um a, a very famous old tree okay so that we talked about higurashi there's an example of another tree as well you know, sort of getting this opportunity for people to, to sort of see trees um, continuing through. And in the West, we're starting now to develop uh, sort of heritage trees. You know, there are trees which have, you know, been owned, been styled by one person, owned by another person, been restyled by somebody else. You know, we're starting to build up that sort of, um, that, that sort of heritage. Uh, and then, you know, some of the other reasons for, for why people um, kind of put their trees out on display, showing off um, both either their wealth or their talent, uh, and, and, and all this kind of things and you know a lot of people sort of do talk about um, the, the kind of the somebody's mentioned it in the uh, in the chat about needing to, to spend an incredible amount of money uh, in order to, 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 to put things in, in big exhibitions you don't have to uh, you can take a cutting and work on a cutting for 10 15 20 years 30 years and get it to that highest level if, you, if, if you're proficient or you can take a check and write it out uh, and put it on, you know, buy a, an expensive tree and put it out onto on, on show. The reasons behind people doing that are two very different things. Okay, the appreciation as a as a viewer is the same to a certain extent. When you're just sort of looking at it as a, an object without that deeper understanding or that deeper knowledge of it. Okay, so uh, this is one of those um, uh, trees of the the, the history, for example. You know, this tree was uh, it disappeared for for a number of years, and um, when it finally came like came out um, of hiding, it went into somebody's collection for, 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 for you know ten fifteen years. It previously been uh, sort of shown at exhibitions and things like that. When it finally came out into in, in, into the sort of the, the public domain, everybody was like, "Oh, that's where it is! Oh, look how much it's improved!" 
uh, you know, it was, it was a very sort of, uh, it, was, it was great to see and people were sort of really sort of happy to, to, to sort of see that trade. Uh, the, the sort of the showing off of, of the wealth aspect of, of, of bonsai is an you know, example of this here, you see. When we're sort of looking at, uh, you know, the artistic areas of, of bonsai, um, uh, and this is where the argument between sort of the, the, the kind of the artistic statements of, you know, behind um, the, the people who are kind of uh, doing bonsai. You know, when we look at this, this is, a, this is a very deep and powerful artistic statement about the horrors of war. This isn't an artistic statement in any way, shape or form. This is just following a set standard pattern. There's very little artistry kind of gone into the creation of this display. Uh, that's not to say that it's not possible to do this kind of, um, to, to take bonsai to, to and make an artistic statement uh, with bonsai. This is something from the, the exhibition I did in 2013 and it's called Natural Flux. Uh, this was by, um, the tree was mine, uh, but the, 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 the thing it's displayed in, uh, this sort of steampunk um, sort of sculpture uh, that, that in, used the bonsai uh, as a part of it was, uh, was made by an Australian artist uh, who sadly passed away, uh, Thor Beowulf, that's his, that's his real name, uh, and he was a really interesting guy, uh, and he was looking at kind of you know, making artistic statements with bonsai and doing this kind of thing, uh, and this was, you know, his idea was about the, 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 the capture of oxygen, uh, with this, you know, making a statement about um, uh, sort of deforestation uh, and the future of, of the human race is going to be growing trees in, in these environments to, to, to kind of capture the oxygen that they give off. Um, it is difficult to, to, to try and move away from that uh, kind of sort of traditional model of, of doing bonsai without coming up against a lot of um, uh, people kind of saying it's, it's, it's not bonsai, it's this, it's that or anything. Uh, and it is something that, that has to be done with great sort of caution and care because uh, the more kind of kitsch it can become or the, the more kind of trying to move sort of too far away from it, um, then you're moving away from the, from, the, from the concept of bonsai as um, a, you know, a living natural object. And uh, this is a, a, a piece that was created, um, it's, been, it's been around for a while, uh, this was displayed at the um, Artisans Cup 2015 in America uh, and caused a lot of controversy. People, some people liked it, some people didn't. Okay, uh, I personally kind of thought it was, it was very interesting, very cool. There's some things about it as a you know an artistic piece that could have been improved on. Um, go to their website and look at the listen to the comments and things like that for if you want more information. Um, but you know, sort of doing things. Sort of differently and trying to make some some sort of artistic statements is is something which people have always tried to do and, and looked at exploring. This is something that you know something I was doing this spring and it's something that I've always kind of always looked to do. Uh, this is something that I created, uh, and it's it's difficult to do. It's difficult to break break out of that sort of traditional model. Um, and is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? But when you you know you, when you're looking at bonsai as an art form. You know, the, the, there are avenues to, to, to be explored, but it only really becomes an art form when it gets uh, people to view it. And so the act of displaying these things is the essential part of it becoming an art form. So if we look at the kind of the, the history of, um, uh, of display in Japan, uh, when we look back to, to kind of, you know, as it came across from China, um, it started becoming very popular, um, well not very popular, slightly popular amongst um, the aristocratic people as I said. Um, a lot of the people kind of like living in, in these sort of compounds, the aristocrats, uh, kept bonsai outdoors in, the, in their gardens. Uh, and this is where we see all of the images of bonsai. It was just something that was kept outside. Uh, they were kept in the gardens, they were never brought in because they were too dirty. The Japanese as you know, when you go into a Japanese house you take off your shoes, the outside is the outside, the inside is the inside. Uh, and so the thought of bringing this dirty, insect-covered tree, which was being fertilised with essentially with excrement, into the uh, inner parts of the house would have been forbidden. This is one of the reasons why we don't see any kind of crossover between bonsai and the tea ceremony. The tea ceremony has this long history going back, you know, to, to the sort of the 16th century, uh, and they never used bonsai. They wouldn't have started using it until. Uh, if they use it at all, 
uh, until the more, sort of the more modern era, uh, and that sort of modern era really be begins in the in the Meiji period. Uh, so the Meiji Restoration, 1868, basically Japan goes on under this uh, revolution. Uh, the the old feudal system disappears. Democracy kind of comes in, um, and the the merchant class in particular, that middle class, that upper middle class, um, have the ability to practice um, the arts in a lot more. Japan's opened up. The, you know, the, there's there's wealth. The, the the society just blooms and blossoms. Uh, and this is where we start to see images of bonsai being displayed indoors. Uh, this is a picture from a book in 1896 called Japanese Topsy Turvydom, uh, which is a kind of interesting book written by an Australian uh, music and dance teacher, uh, where she kind of talks about all these different areas of, of Japanese um, culture and things like that. Uh, and here we see um, some trees uh, and some uh, sago palms there sort of uh, being displayed uh, in, in the sort of the Tokonoma. You may have seen these pictures, I think they're in the uh, one of the, the uh, book by the Nippon Bonsai Association uh, and these are pictures taken from a book that was um, published in the early 1900s uh, and this is really the kind of like the beginning of the artistic movement uh, where we start to see trees placed on stands and, and displayed in artistic ways um, and so here's some of those images and these are kind of like early 1900s this was done by a group of bonsai professionals um, in and around the Tokyo area and they put on these displays in um, high-end restaurants where wealthy patrons would be um, uh, eating uh, in an attempt to kind of uh, get them interested in bonsai and have them as patrons and so you can start to see you know the the, the act of bonsai putting them bring them indoors to where they can be appreciated uh, by a uh, discerning audience and you start to see ideas of um, direction and the artistic elements sort of being brought in okay soon after this we start to see so the you know 1920s improved travel in Japan communications people are wealthy bonsai starting to, to pick up uh, it's easy to, to transport trees around uh, we start to see exhibitions happening um, the first national exhibitions start in like 1920s. A lot of them are held outdoors. Uh, Hibiya Park was a famous place for, for holding exhibitions. Uh, and the reason for this is basically they were using, there's no other word than shit to, uh, to, to say, uh, as their fertilizer. So they were putting excrement on the trees in order to fertilize them. So they stank. Uh, and so it's very difficult to bring that to, to get a museum. Uh, to or you know a, an exhibition space to, to kind of accept them uh, into and this is you know it's documented down there's there's, there's there's evidence of this so it wasn't until they you know some cultivation uh, techniques were changed that allowed them to to kind of go on uh, and start putting um, ex, ex, exhibitions on in in the museums uh, a cockfu ten uh, has been held this was kind of the, the big first major uh, exhibition that was held indoors uh, it's been held in various different museums uh, across Tokyo throughout the years. 1935, I think, was the first one. I can't remember. I should have it written down. Um, but and it was held initially kind of like twice a year. Uh, and then the war happened and then it kind of changed on. So although we're up to number 95 now, I think, um, you know, it's nine, 1935, I think, was the first one. Um, and so obviously the, the two don't necessarily mix up. Um, but the the prestige, I mean, this was the in order to, to get a tree in at that time, uh, you had to be very very wealthy, uh, and that's obviously something that's con con sort of con continued through. Uh, the prestige associated with with being in the Kokofu Ten in Japan has always been very very incredible. You used to see, uh, and you know, the enthusiasts uh, at the Mr Kobayashi's nursery desperate to kind of like get into into the Kokofu uh, and things like that. Uh, but you can see the um, the images. This is from the the number six. Uh, which is one of the the only book the earliest book that I have. Uh, you see the images of of the, the the exhibitions, and very little has changed between then and now. Uh, all of the the people um, sort of viewing it are basically old men, uh, and the trees are displayed in a very sort of similar way. Uh, this is um, uh, the one of the pages from the book, uh, and the text reads: "The exhibition was held in the basement of the museum, using all twelve rooms. In four of the rooms, a glass case was was constructed in the middle." Uh, inside which reference trees were exhibited. Okay, uh, so yeah, as you can say, very lot has changed between then uh, and now. Uh, we saw these pictures in the Shohin stream, and you can see that kind of the the artistry 
the like the, the the concept of excuse me of kind of putting art into some of these displays the the, the direction uh, and things like that but yet to really kind of like come in so we look at this and this was the highest level of japan uh, of, of bonsai display in you know let's just say for argument's sake 1940 and if you did that now you'd get laughed at not everybody was artistically challenged there are some some displays uh, uh, at that time which were very well done uh, but some of them are slightly less okay so this is one which is you know a real kind of interestingly well spaced out um, uh, display but not all of them were so that kind of model of, 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 of exhibitions has carried on to this day and it's kind of like almost identical format no matter, no matter sort of where you go uh, and with these kind of exhi exhibitions it's it's very, there is very little kind of like artistry that you can kind of really get into it it's quite a lit sort of a limited form um, for, for various different reasons uh, and sadly attendance is mostly from within the, the bonsai community um, the only kind of real times you can kind of get out is when you take it to different audiences and things like that uh, so you know, these are the sort of the standard kind of exhibition images that we sort of see. Um, and there is, as I said, there's, there's little difference between those. These now, these are sort of relatively modern pictures. Uh, this is the cockfoo. This is a picture stolen off the internet from Bill Valvanis's blog. Um, you know, there's, there's very little difference between the way in which the trees are exhibited then and now. Obviously, the level of the quality of the trees is, is different. Um, uh, the Shohin world is one where you sort of see a, a big sort of step up in the in, in the difference, but obviously that we cover that in a different stream. Uh, and when we actually kind of like look at the the history of of like the exhibits and things like that, we actually kind of come across quite. A, look at the language that was used when we look at this kind of pre-boom bonsai books. And when we're talking about the boom in bonsai, we're talking about like the 1960s particularly. Uh, you know, the 60s onwards. This is when bonsai really kind of exploded. So you had that big explosion um, in the Meiji period, uh, and then, you know, the the post-war 1960s, 70s boom, like the 1964 Olympics, and then the 1970 Osaka Expo. Those were two major um, leaps forward. And then the the around that time as well was the the creation of the the, the Nippon Bonsai Association, um, and this kind of guiding force. Uh, for bonsai uh, and so we start to see bonsai moving forward a lot there but before that sort of period the when you look at the texts um, and you know some of these older books which we have here the history of bonsai uh, and stuff like that uh, you look at go, just so that I'm not making it up uh, you look at the the language that gets used uh, and when they're talking about exhibitions and things they use this word here chinletsu which literally means just to, to 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 set up so it's easier to see, you know. Uh, and they used to call the exhibition chinletsukai, so literally just putting tree after tree in order. Okay, rather than in any type, any using kind of any uh, artistic language, rather than talking about them as art forms and things like that, they were just thing they were just put on display so that it was easier to see. And as I said, as you saw with some of those older pictures, there were. Um, elements of you know sort of people from that early period that were looking at it as trying to make something which had sort of uh, artistic cohesion that was able to sort of tell a story uh, but that those ideas came into bonsai really from the sort of the 1960s onwards uh, and then we start to see the word change the word that gets used when talking about display uh, changed to from chinetsu, from chinetsu kai and things like that, to kazari. Um, people talk when they're talking about putting a tree on 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 display, they use this word kazari, which literally means to decorate. Uh, and so obviously we would, you know, the the English equivalent would be um, display. Okay. Uh, and when we sort of now sort of talk about sort of tokonoma kazari uh, and and things like that, I. Uh, the, the real sort of big difference between that kind of like that chinetsu, the, the, the exhibit, uh, and then the, the kind of like the, the display uh, is sort of really relates to, to the kind of like the space uh, in which it's uh, exhibited or displayed, put, put out there. 
so when we're looking at that kind of like exhibit, the um, the chinetsukai, the, the putting it out in in a row essentially to to make it easier to see. You know, this is that type of um, aesthetic. And like I said, this isn't a criticism at all. Okay, I just want to make that. Sure. I said that at the start. I've said it now. It's not at all. This is just how it kind of in my from my experience and my knowledge this is how it's kind of evolved okay so this is the kind of the um the exhibit sort of style of of aesthetics when we're when we're looking at that kind of setting it up it makes it to what it's to, to easier to see and then this is where that word kazali to decorate really sort of comes into play when we're looking at um it becoming a piece of art uh, an artistic statement a picture something which evokes a response in the viewer is where we have this space free from distractions in order to create an atmosphere so that that idea of you know the space and the time is very 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 important with when we're looking at the the display of bonsai and thinking about it as an artistic object you know the context is very important the space occasion when we're looking at that exhibition sort of style, like chinretsu, the the rowing, the the lining it up so it's easier to see, uh, you know, it's a, it's 101 trees all lined up within the self same space. It's not not a massively intimate setting, and so the tree has to sort of stand out in order to to kind of gain um, the viewer's attention. So this is why certain trees and certain styles have really sort of come into um, popularity uh you know from from the from the japanese perspective and then also from you know the the western perspective uh which has taken its cues uh, from 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 japan so you know the, those powerful trees those powerful images uh stand out when lined up when you come when you sort of start, start to take it to uh these slightly less or a more intimate um, sort of location, a more intimate setting, then it's a, a relationship between a few people rather than six thousand people in a hall in Belgium or uh, in a, in in Rochester. It requires a lot more kind of thought and artistic input in order to to really kind of create uh, the sort of similar type of, of kind of like impact uh, and to really sort of captivate the the, the viewer. Uh, and so, if we just sort of, we'll get to the to the to the, the Kazari bit, bit a little bit later. But we we'll just sort of um, sort of go back to to, to what I was saying about like the modern uh, uh, sort of exhibition aesthetics. When bonsai was it is kind of like most competitive, uh, we saw this this the, the definition um, of this kind of like this modern um, bonsai aesthetic and. Dave DeGroat said about it in the recent um, uh, podcast, the Asymmetry podcast from, the, from Bonsai Mirai, about this kind of this universal idea about what bonsai has become, uh, this sort of you know universal style. You know, this really sort of came from this period um, because that's when bonsai was really kind of booming, up, you know, across the world, um, and we sort of start. We, we were looking at those images, and, and that's kind of like becoming printed on the brain, so to speak. Um, and this is when you know bonsai in Japan was really competitive. You know, to try and get into Kokofuta, which at the time would have been maybe sort of 230, 250 trees on display. You know, to to get into the judging, there may have been anything up to eight or nine hundred, and so it was super competitive. People were pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, and every aspect, like when you when it's like that competitive, you've really got to sort of stand out. And this is where everything kind of. Sort of came about this this idea you know try to make the tree look bigger try to real really kind of like captivate uh and also the the kind of the the, the, the look making the you know the, the trees themselves kind of like look very um perfect and, and highly refined and, and well worked another aspect of of this and this is something however that that um has always been um part of the the, the kokofu in particular uh, it was the the use of like very sort of high quality um, ceramics and tables and such like, and so this is one of the, the sort of the greatest examples of um, 
of that kind of uh, of aesthetic where everything about this is designed to make that tree look massive if you look at the stand that it's put on you know the 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 height considerations for for, for the cockapoo are one of the reasons why this low stand has been been chosen because this tree is going to be at least uh probably about 80 centimeters tall you know the pot add another sort of 25 centimeters to it you know the backdrops themselves are only say one meter 40 or something like that and so you, you put that up on a much more powerful sort of stand the tree's going to get lost above the top of, of, of the backdrop you put that on a much more powerful stand it reduces the the visual impact of the tree you know when you're looking at that as a tree out there on display crammed into that tiny little into that relatively small pot you're like wow that's impressive and then you look at it on that table and you're like wow that's heavy you know you feel as though that table is going to kind of collapse on it and so these things were by some people for, for certain these were kind of like you know sort of deliberately chosen when we sort of look at some of the trees in very very sort of small pots this is a this is a really quite tight pot for, for a camellia to, to kind of grow in unless you're very very sort of um Sort of skillful, uh, 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 you know, horticulturally. When we look at some of the, the the trees on display and things like that, you know, they've been specially planted into into very sort of small, tight pots in order to really accentuate the the size of the trees and things like that. So it's not always, you know, necessarily uh, the pot that the, the the tree sort of lives in for for the, for the whole time, but chosen specifically to to really highlight the the, the tree. Uh, and as I said, you know, the, the cockapoo is about, you know, this kind of like perfectly manicured trees. As I said, this, this came about during that real bubble period when it's very easy for the judges. When you've got 900 trees and you've got to sort of judge them in two days, which is kind of like how the, the judging went on. You know, how do you, like what criteria do you, do you, do you base the, um, the, the, the decisions on? Obviously, the, you know, there's a certain amount of, sort of species dependency. You can't just have a, you know, an exhibition of all conifers. Or all deciduous trees and things like that, but when you when you've got all these trees which are, you know, phenomenally Im impressive specimens, you kind of like people will, will naturally kind of gravitating towards the ones where you could sort of see how much effort had gone into into trees uh, and things like that. Um, and you know, it's just that kind of that concept of perfection really sort of came from that competitive a a a area. Uh, and so what we see, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons for this as well, um, is the um, with the with the, the the preparation of the trees, and this is something that we, you know, as apprentices, we were you know tasked to do. And I talked about it in the stream with with Akiyama. Uh, that kind of the preparation for for the, the cockatoo judging was 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 a very nerve wracking time where everything had to be done you know, beautifully, including kind of like the the uh, the soil preparation, you know, the, the putting the moss on. Uh, and the, the kind of the, the use of moss uh, was one of those ways in which um, bonsai was able to to, to, to kind of to, to be brought into to inside. So when we're thinking back to the, the, the sort of the start of um, the the exhibition, uh, you know, when, when trees were first being allowed to, to be brought in indoors, uh, and that concept of the, the dirt being unacceptable inside you know the the, the kind of the, the covering over of, of the you know the soil surface uh is a way particularly uh in the in the in the kado school of of thought is a way of kind of like trying to 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 disguise some of that um the the dirty nature of the trees uh but it's also something which is definitely kind of um an important part of the the kind of the creating um this this idea of perfection uh, and also um, enabling the viewer to to, to kind of uh, to, to to look at the whole, um, and so you know a, a skillful moss job is one which kind of would, would reflect the the natural environment of a tree, uh, but also be so subtle that the the viewer actually sort of never sees it. Okay. Anyway, we're, I'm getting getting distracted. And time's going on. Uh, so yeah, so these are some of the images of the, of that kind of like modern. Um, Japanese uh, sort of dispersal. It's, it's, a, it's actually sort of starting to change now and become a lot looser. Um, but you can see that kind of like, you know, there we go, the perfect mossing. And, you know, this this pristine, this tight little pot. There's absolutely no way that this tree could survive in that long term. Absolutely no way. And this is one that Mr. Kobayashi did. You know, immediately after that, it would have been uh, it would have been separated from that pot. Uh, but some of those traditions have, have always been there, as I sort of said, with um, the, the kind of like the use of 
uh, antique Chinese um, uh, ceramics. Uh, and when you sort of look at any of the, the pre-boom uh, Kokofu uh, exhibits, so you know, going back to when it was a, a less widely practiced um, pursuit, every single tree was in an antique Chinese pot. Uh, and up until recently, this has always been the case. Uh, one of the issues for, for a lot of trees now is that they're starting to get too big and it's impossible to fit them into those older um, uh, antique pots because obviously they, you can't just go and build a new antique pot. Uh, but the, you often see um, uh, the same pots reoccurring uh, throughout the, to, to, you know, in, in the different cockafoos because they are just uh, incredible pieces of ceramic. Uh, and that kind of tradition, um, the, the provenance of both the pots and stands and trees, are uh, important aspects of it. Um, and you, you know, there are people who um, appreciate that. You know, they'll, they'll, you'll go and see uh, Bill Varvanis, for example, on his blog. You know, he he puts up he put up some pictures of trees from, you know, going way back um, to, to early cockafoos, and then you know the tree as it is now and things like that. Um, and when you are looking at uh, the, ex the ex exhibit, there may be some trees that you'll look at and you'll think, why is that there? Um, and this is something, again, that's, that's, that's come from the, 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 the traditional approach to bonsai for the, for the Japanese. And there are a lot of kind of species that are very difficult to grow that are, you know, you might not necessarily get them into, into great shapes um, or they might not be particularly great artistic um, sort of designs and things like that but they are allowed into the show they're, they're put there because they are just sort of unique or famous or superb examples of them as a, as a species and this that kind of like the, the you know the appreciation of weird species and things is something which which does date back to uh the Meiji period and and before you know particularly sort of Edo um period bonsai and just general horticulture in 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 in, in general anyway uh, this is a, a tree that was um, on display this year at the the Cockfrey. This is an oak. Again, you might look at that and think, why does that deserve to be um, on display at the, the highest level of Japanese bonsai? Uh, it's an oak. There aren't many many oaks in Japanese bonsai that are that interesting. Uh, again, this is a tree you think, oh, maybe that's not got, got so, such sort of great uh, ramification da, da, da. as a magnolia, which this is. Cascade Magnolia, there are a few that are better than it. This is a well-known tree. The, the pod it's in is a, is a phenomenal piece of um, uh, ceramic, antique uh, sort of Chinese, uh, Japanese, I think it is, uh, ceramic, uh, and the stand as well. Out of season stand, but this is a very, very beautiful piece of, of, of work. Uh, this tree here, you may think that's just a, you know, a, a pretty boring, bog-standard uh, azalea. Uh, but the stand, the the pot that it's in, is a famous kowatari, so real ancient antique uh, sort of uh, chi Chinese pot. Same for the uh, this uh, the the boke. quince that that's displayed there. You know that's put, that's put into into a really nice uh, piece of ceramic. The stands that they're on, and so it may not look like a particularly a great artistic statement or anything like that but you know one of the reasons why they get in like this is because of the the quality of of, of all of the aspects uh, of, of the of the display you know that's something which definitely does go back to um to to the older the, the cockafoo displays and things like that uh this is uh a, a, you know a very well-known pot uh, there as well okay so I need a break. Uh, going back to, to the sort of the display, uh, where we're not looking at that kind of exhibit aesthetic, when we're looking at kind of the, the display where it becomes a bit more of an artistic endeavour. What we're trying to do in that in those types of displays is entertain the spirit, for example, set a mood, convey a message. Uh, and again, here, uh, the, this is something where Kind of the the use of the correct tools is very very important. So when we use the when we mean tools, we're talking about scrolls, uh, accent plants, or accent objects and things like that. Um, and 
particularly with this, we start to see uh, you, you can bring in a very sort of spiritual aspect to, to, to kind of how a lot of these displays, um, you know, the meanings behind them. Uh, but a lot of this is dependent upon kind of like the education of the viewer. And this is where like bonsai starts to kind of like take up, go up to a, to a much sort of higher level. Um, and when we look at sort of the, the Tokonoma displays, uh, so Tokonoma is a special place uh, traditionally in, excuse me, uh, in Japanese homes, very few people will have them now. But this is a, an area where family would, when they had guests around, they would sit them in front of the Tokonoma uh, and put their put, you know, beautiful objects on display for, for appreciation. Uh, and, you know, the, the bon bonsai being displayed in the Tokonoma has only really been, as I sort of said, we only sort of started to see that happening uh, in the Meiji period, but only in this sort of, sort of way, uh, becoming sort of really sort of formalised. Uh, only sort of much much later uh, this is a, a a picture which you know a display which a lot of people may look at that and think oh that's really nice and pretty uh, but for japanese uh this is uh this you know this has a, a much sort of deeper meaning um and so when we start to get to that level of um artistic statements artistic uh, endeavor we there, there's a certain amount of knowledge which which does become uh, important in order to, to appreciate it. So, for example, this uh, this is an exhibit that would, uh, or a display that would be put on at New Year's. The reason being is that we have Sho Chikubai, the pine, the bamboo. Oh, back, sorry. The pine, the bamboo, and then the plum. And these three objects, these three items are always displayed together um, uh, at New Year's. Tradition, they go to uh, let's go together. Traditionally, this is uh, concepts which go back to Confucianism, uh, you know, and, and Chinese uh, culture, and things like that. The three old friends they're called. Uh, and so, for mo for some Westerners who don't necessarily have that background knowledge, just look at it and think, "Oh, that looks all right." But why is there an accent plant? But the use of the bamboo holder, the use of this gold, very important point there. The gold celebratory pine image on the fan and the plum tree those two things together any reasonably well educated Japanese person would look at that and say New Year's um, but yes the the, the, the kind of like the, the Tokonoma displays as we see here it's a way of taking it out and creating this very intimate atmosphere this very intimate relation this this, this the ability to, 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 to kind of like have a much deeper relationship with the with the tree as an artistic object and as the you know the, the, the space as a whole so here are just a few uh, just as i said you know this this concept of of, of context and the, and the space is very very important without this whole background without the space that it's in and the walking through the building the walking through the garden all of the build-up to actually sort of see these things the same um impression doesn't get made and these ideas are something which come very much from uh, the tea ceremony. Uh, so aspects of the, the tea ceremony and the, and the displays that get created for the tea ceremony are something which got brought into bonsai, uh, into this type of bonsai display. It doesn't necessarily, this, this type of uh, creating a, a special space doesn't necessarily have to be in one of those very formal um, tokonomes. It can be what's known as seki kazari, whereby a little space is created you see the the use of the the backdrop the byobu the folding screen uh just to give in this case just to give a you know a nice blank canvas uh the the use of a piece of cloth on the on the board again just to, to sort of create that blank canvas in which to create this this lovely autumnal image it doesn't necessarily need to be white this is a zero, this would have been uh, an exhibit uh, a display that was created at New Year's. Okay, but what's very, very important is this appreciation and the use of space. Not cramming them all in, not everything having even spacing and such like. So, the, the, the feel, the ability to, to relate to the trees becomes completely different when displayed in this manner, as opposed to that kind of exhibition thing and so you're able to use trees which have completely different feels to them which would get lost within that forest of, of um, 
of, of trees in a, in, in a large um, exhibit. Uh, a lot of these pictures are from um, something uh, the, which I'm going to do a stream about in the future. We'll, we'll, so we'll look at this in, in a lot more uh, detail. Uh, but this is, I'll talk about it a bit more actually, uh, just a group of, of like super high end sort of uh, bonsai enthusiasts. But when we actually sort of look at the, the actual kind of what people are doing in terms of um, the, the use of a tree on a stand with an accent object, there isn't a massive difference between what is happening there and what's happening at the Cockafoo or you know, in sort of general exhibitions, except the space and the, the context in which it's being displayed. And so once we, once we sort of look at it like that, when we have all the space and all of the background, the atmosphere completely changes. Whereas you don't get that in the basement of the Metropolitan Art Museum in Tokyo. Another aspect where the sort of the, the, the sort of the, the kazari word gets used is this uh, when we're sort of looking at things displayed on um, uh, chigai dana basically means um, different levels, um, shelves, different shelves uh, is the word I was looking for. Um, and what we're sort of, sort of saying with um, the uh, in the shohin streams and things like that. Not necessarily say art, there's no real artistry involved, it's maybe a little bit harsh, but there is this kind of like, there is a formula to it, and the most, the more sort of successful displays in terms of, uh, you know, being exhibited uh, are those that kind of like sort of stick to that formula and perfect it beautifully. Uh, it's a very complex formula, it's very complex to do. It's not to say that, you know, this sort of artistry, lack of artistry, um, is you know easy to do it's, it's very very difficult but it doesn't have to necessarily be like that it is possible to you know sort of display things uh in the shohin world using the the, the the different sort of rack levels in an artistic way we did talk about this in the in the in, in the shohin stream and sort of covered that uh but one of the things you'll uh, this this here um this, the, the name of it is the sound of the waterfall um, and this evokes a beautiful image very very simply with just three objects this casket sort of semi cascade exposed root white pine here the suiseki with a uh, waterfall on it and just this one sort of single accent point and one of the, the, the things that you'll notice about this what's very important about it is the fact that nothing is really lined up or the the, the off-centered uh, positioning and the arrangements of um, the, the 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 faces of the, the different objects and things like that and so this is one area where that kind of the artistry can become a little bit more apparent rather than it sort of going to that sort of uh, formula so talking about sort of formalized ideas and things like that uh, you may have heard of uh, this uh, the word kado uh, which gets sort of thrown around uh, when sort of talking about sort of particularly tokonoma display uh, and things like that. And this is the only kind of formalized school of display within bonsai. Basically, you know, uh, if you look at other art forms in Japan, um, they exist in a kind of triangular um, system. So ikebana, uh, for example, there's a the, the, the head of the, the, the school is up at the top and what he or she says basically then gets filtered down and practiced by all of the, the practitioners. Uh, and they are the, the kind of the, you know, the, the gatekeepers, the traditional, you know, they, they keep the traditions going and they also sort of push it in, in new, sort of new directions. But it's this very kind of formalized school. What this one person says then gets kind of like sort of filtered down and people move up the levels, etc., etc. That doesn't exist in bonsai. You know, each of the, the gardens has, you know, you know, so the master is present, so for example, Kimura and Kobayashi, and then they have their apprentices and things like that, and there's kind of like loose uh, arrangements of people and things like that, but there isn't this formalized sort of system within bonsai, which is one of the reasons why it is perhaps less popular. <laughs> um, the only person who's done it is uh, Yamada Kaori, uh, who, Kaori, Kaori yeah, um, who has created this but anyway but she, yeah and she's doing very very well in bonsai but anyway uh so the only sort of formalized school um of, of sort of within bonsai really um of any notes 
uh, is this thing called Kado. And only if you sort of go through their, their rigorous kind of um, study period, this, the, the, I, this, you know, go to the meetings and study how to do it properly and, and sort of create these displays, um, can you actually sort of call yourself a, a Kado practitioner? Uh, it began in 1984 uh, under the guidance of a, of a gentleman, very famous gentleman called Kateyama Teichi, who was a really famous sort of bonsai and suiseki collector, enthusiast, um, going back uh, to, you know, just before the war as well. Um, and he was um, a mover and a shaker on the scene. Uh, and he sort of studied under Murata, as I mentioned earlier before, uh, and a lot of the kind of like the famous names and that kind of like pre and post war period um, and he took their ideas and, and things that people were practicing kind of like here there and, and sort of piecemeal um, and sort of the, you know the, the sort of the common practices and kind of like formalized them um, and set down this kind of like strict kind of guidelines um, as to to, to to what a Kado display is or isn't um, and he took on a number of students, uh, a number of professionals, including Mr. Kobayashi. Uh, the chief was one of his five um, professional, uh, kind of, I want to say apprentices, but, you know, students. Um, and other than that, it was basically this kind of um, big group of sort of high-end enthusiasts who were looking at taking bonsai to this kind of like higher level of practice, higher level of artistry. Uh, and they had their own little club called Ichiyukai. Uh, which came from his uh, artistic name, um, which was uh, Ichiyu. And they put on these uh, exhibits in um, Tokonomas, in these very beautiful traditional Japanese buildings uh, and such like. And so a lot of these, uh, he, he created uh, a three-piece um, set of books, which is very difficult to get hold of. Um, I believe they might be uh, re reissuing them. Um, but they were basically this kind of like textbook of um, these types of tokonoma type displays. Uh, and it would talk about the all of the elements, um, you know, the, the trees, the stand, the score, all of these things were named uh, and would give an explanation as to the kind of like the, the meaning behind the, the display or what, what the artist, uh, what, essentially what Mr. Katayama was trying to kind of uh, create with the... Uh, with the displays. There were three books. Uh, one of them was Bonsai, one of them was Suiseki, and the other was uh, kind of like Kusumono uh, and things like that. And the they were split up into, into five different sections. There was New Year's, Spring, Summer, Autumn, and then Winter. Uh, and so some of it, like this, this uh, display here, for example, uh, this would have been a, a great summer uh, exhibit. Uh, and then Obviously, some of the other ones from different seasons. The uh, Prunus, for example, that we saw uh, was a New Year's display. Uh, and one of the, some of the things that you'll see running through all of those sort of uh, the the Kado displays uh, and the kind of the, the overriding aesthetic uh, was very simple, real sort of strong sense of seasonality. So as I said, broken down into those four five different seasons uh, and, and objects to relate to to, to that. One of the other things that's very, very important is the space. There's a lot of space that gets involved um, with the uh, um, with the display. Somebody's just put up their Japanese ornamentation for the Four Seasons. There we go. English text has already been published. Somebody told me it was coming out. There we go. Uh, put up a link, Michael. Um, but the, the importance of that space is uh, it was very very important this is comes into something uh, a japanese aesthetic concept called yugen uh, and this is whereby the kind of the mystery the mystery um and the kind of of of, of empty space uh, and this is something which i will talk about in another stream particularly with, with suiseki and things like that um but it's the the kind of the there is nothing there but there actually is and so when you kind of look at this display here if this was just an empty space, then you would look at this this area here and it wouldn't feel anything. It would just be empty space. But because of the relationship between these two objects and the, the, the lines and the, the visual weights and things like this, the imagery that gets that gets created 
the space feels completely different. We see it in the no theatre. This is where the, the, the concept of Yuga really sort of comes through, where these minimal movements create this incredible amount of imagery uh, and this incredible feeling within the viewers, although the person is actually doing very, very little. As this is kind of like mystery behind nothing. Um, and that's kind of a, a very important aspect of this uh, Kaido school and just sort of Japanese aesthetics in general. Uh, and obviously a lot of this requires sort of a, a lot of study, not just of, of bonsai itself and the practices, but other you know, the intertwining threads of, of Japanese culture and such like, particularly the tea ceremony, uh, calligraphy and, and such like this. There is a lot of a sort of a spiritual aspect to, to some of this uh, and a lot of it was just absolute nonsense because I came up against this a few times. I was taken to one of their meetings by um, uh, by Mr. Kobayashi as a, as a student uh, when I was an apprentice there. Uh, we happened to, to go to, um, to one of these meetings that, 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 were held, held in, that, that was being held um, and Cut long story short, one of these blokes, uh, one of these guys was there and he, he, I'd, I'd sort of spoken a little bit in my really bad Japanese and, 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 and sort of told them what I thought about some of these displays and things like that and they all laughed at me. Uh, and then this one guy, um, he came to me and he said, do you know why the, the, the colour of the tokonomas, why it's this, this sandy colour, he says to me. And I understood what he was saying and I was just like, mm. I was like, no, no I don't. And he's like, it's the same colour as our skin. Uh, and I was just like, really? Really? Never heard that before. And I asked Mr. Kobayashi out as we were driving back. I said, you know, this guy said about the colour of the skin. You know, as though I couldn't feel the same sense of calm, the same sense of of, uh, of beauty, because I had a different colour of skin. Uh, and the chief just looked at me and says, just, he's talking rubbish. Uh, so you do get a little bit of that within, within some of it, but uh, maybe that's just me and my, my cynicism. Uh, but the head of the school uh, is a guy called uh, Mr. Sudo, who you may have heard uh, sort of describe. I'm going to sort of skip through a little bit of this because I'm talking way too much. Um, but he basically kind of like was in, in association with Mr. Katayama. They kind of put the school together um, and he's the, now the sort of, or was, uh, I think he's still is actually, the, the head teacher of the, of the, the school and kind of um, responsible for its artistic direction. And he, like his artistic sense is like, when it comes to, 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 to Tokonoma displays and things like that, it's absolutely second to none. Um, phenomenal, kind of, he had his beautiful, uh, this garden and setup and everything, which is an incredible um, uh, place to go and, and see all of these things on display. Uh, a place called Chikufuen, if you ever get the opportunity to go. Uh, it's about two hours north of Tokyo. Uh, but his first, one of his apprentices, not his first apprentice, um, but one of his apprentices was Mr. Morimai that we sort of came and, and he was in one of the previous pictures and he's now kind of like taking on um, the the mantle of kind of creating this the same idea and he's created a different group of of, um, um, of enthusiasts called the Genko Kai which some of these pictures have, have come from uh, but basically the sort of same idea getting this this elite group of, of, of enthusiasts who are looking at kind of creating these beautiful displays in special locations basically uh, and so some of these are some of the pictures uh, from the, the Kado displays uh, that they, they, would, they would put on um, exhibits. Um, uh, and this is this is one of Mr. Sudo's um, beautiful um, displays that he put on. Um, okay, sorry, I was just checking something on the, on, the, on the chat there. Right, so Mr. Moramai, uh, as I said, he is... Um, one of the, the movers and shakers of bonsai at the moment and he created a magazine called Wabi, nothing to do with Wabi Sabi um, or anything like that uh, and it, he's basically doing what um, has been done before in the bonsai world but just doing it in a modern, more modern way uh, so these are some pictures of the um, from, from his magazine, the, the, the magazine Wabi came out, um, they haven't put it out um, because the internet happened uh, but it went to about 17 issues 18 issues maybe and it was kind of like an auction magazine uh, where you could buy some beautiful objects and also um, loads of like you know, articles and, and interesting things. Uh, but he put, you know, um, this is some of the pictures from there. Uh, and this is something that he still does today, this company still does today, putting uh, bonsai in restaurants in expensive areas. Uh, these are some displays of uh, by Mr. Kobayashi. 
Uh, so you can see that same type of uh, aesthetic idea coming through from the Kado school, this idea of seasonality. Okay, that's a bit blurry. Okay, but all of the objects that get used within this school are, you know, they, they, or within these uh, displays are of the absolute highest quality. Uh, and so this uh, doban here is considered to be one of the masterpieces of um, doban. That's the word I'm looking for, copper basin trays uh, that get used for suiseki by uh, the, the craftsman called Hone. Um, that's a bit blurry, but again, this the, the, the you know this Tokonoma display of just pure simplicity, just one or two objects here in that sort of in that space. So as I sort of mentioned about there, all of the elements uh, within the, the, the those sort of displays um, are chosen with great care. Everything is of kind of the, the, the highest quality, pots, stands, etc. But in order to, to make uh, a display which is sort of coherent and works very, very well, all of these ob objects need to be sort of carefully considered in, in various different uh, con ideas and terms of like size, age, season, formality, gender. Uh, and all of the, the, the things that get used are accents or accessories. They are designed to... Um, to make either the tree or the stone, if you're displaying stones, but just to keep talking about trees, uh, to the, the sort of the, the the center of it, rather than sort of to to dis to distract too much. When we're looking at these uh, look at these displays, we often sort of look at trying to sort of whether sort of the focal point of um, uh, of displays um, are. So we're we're looking at the the this the, the pine that's exhibited on the on the left hand side there you know this is a very powerful tree uh, and so it's displayed in such a way that it's allowed to, to the, the power of that tree is allowed to, to kind of muscle in uh, objects uh, are placed in such a way so that we can feel the the, the power and the force of the tree with this uh, much more sort of feminine well balanced display this is much more designed to make you feel autumn this is much more designed to make you look at the tree and so through the use of different objects different sizes different you know much more feminine looking objects much more masculine looking objects you know able to, to kind of change the, the, the sort of the, the focal point uh, here everything is designed to make us to look at the tree there's a gentleman here looking at the tree. This was uh, something that was designed to, to, to in a sales area to make somebody drive by it. So make him look, make him look at the tree. One aspect of uh, this type of display that a lot of people in the West find very difficult to, to try to, to do uh, or perhaps even sort of comprehend in a lot of ways is the, the scrolls. And this is one area that you sort of tend to see um, uh, failures of um, people doing it in the West. Um, people putting scrolls upside down, the wrong way around, putting them at the wrong heights and things like this. If you're trying to to mimic this uh, this sort of Japanese aesthetic, then you know you need to sort of have a wide range of scrolls and a a really good kind of understanding of the of the meanings behind the images and, and such like that. And it can be very very difficult to find matching scrolls because. As I said, you know everything needs to be kind of an accent, to helping the the main object to, to to be shown up, and so there are not many artists who want to play second fiddle. So a lot of the scrolls that get created are quite powerful images. The artist wants to show off their um, their prowess as an artist, and so you find it difficult to, to to find something which works well as a secondary object. And so quite often you'll see scrolls that are too powerful, overpower the, 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 the tree and such like that. So obviously being subtle, very, very important. Another thing that uh, is quite often sort of overlooked is the, is the display height within within the space. And obviously in different spaces, uh, you, when we're at exhibits and things like that, you are limited to you know, kind of the, the height of, of, of backdrops and such like. Um, 
but considering the, the the height of you know so for example the moon or water images water like images uh you know it's, it's all about trying to sort of create that image that, that that idea and all these sort of subtle little clues will enable the viewer to be able to excuse me to um uh, to visualize what you're trying to, to, to put forward a lot easier. So, looking at a couple of scrolls, which is the more suitable for, for bonsai display? Clearly this one across here. Okay, this is a very kind of elaborately patterned uh, scroll. It's going to take the eye away from whatever you're looking at displaying. This is a very kind of vague and indistinct uh, type of image. It's ideal. We've got vague and indistinct image, but we've got this really weird looking ornate um, kidney bean shape, tiny little picture. It's not that's not that type of scroll isn't really going to work for uh, for, a, for a bonsai display. The one thing that we look at that, that often gets um, mentioned uh, in terms of people looking at kind of like Western displays where calligraphy is used is nobody can really read it, and this is a problem that the Japanese have as well, uh, and so. When sort of if you're looking at using calligraphy, there's no reason that that, that people displaying in the West uh, can't do that. Uh, but it has meaning; it has to be respected. Um, and as a viewer, if you if the viewer can't read it, it's being disrespectful to the viewer. And really, the whole point of bonsai display is to convey certain um, meanings from from the artist to the viewer via the medium of the tree. And so, if you're putting a bonsai, if you're putting a calligraphy scroll out there without really uh, a meaning it's like you're too stupid to understand what this means when you know that's not a great meaning to, to be sort of putting across or I'm too stupid to, 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 to put out uh, you know the uh, the meaning of this and so or I'm just following a pattern so to speak so it's very kind of important um, to, 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 to have it relevant to, to the tree both for the, for the Japanese when they're putting things out on display uh, and sort of doing it in the west as well uh, and this idea of hanging scrolls is something that which again which comes from from the tea ceremony particularly but also from from other aspects of, of Japanese culture you know it dates back to, to the times of scholars um, enjoying art as intellectual pursuits uh, it's not just having any old characters up there saying you know egg fried rice or whatever uh, so this scroll, this is one from, this is a picture from the uh, Omiya Bonsai Museum. Uh, and this is the scroll that it has up there, and it reads Kumpu Jinarai. And this is a Zen saying, Zengo, a Zen phrase. Uh, and it comes from a poem from the Tang Dynasty. Uh, it's a Chinese text from, from, the, from the Tang Dynasty, um, where the emperor is reflecting on suffering of people in intense heat but secretly he really enjoys it and he doesn't want to leave kind of like the imperial palace uh to you know to, to go up to the to the mountains where it might be cooler because he enjoys the heat uh, and there's this sort of this text which is talking about that uh, and in that text there's this one sentence which basically is written on the scroll there uh, and this is a phrase which is is, is used is, is written by uh, by monks and such like uh, and has been part of the, the Zen uh, kind of philosophy, Zen teachings uh, for, for a number of time, uh, for a number of years uh, and is... stupid spelling mistake there, uh, sorry, uh, and it, it, the, as a scroll, uh, particularly in the, sort of the tea ceremony, um, it would be displayed at the start of, Mar of May when we're first starting to to feel the, um, the 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 first summer winds there's this kind of like warming wind uh, which sort of uh, blows in and the idea is that that kind of allows you to, to kind of like blow away the cobwebs from, from the winter and the, and, and the spring uh, and kind of like refresh your mind and reset uh, and the other meaning of the the kind of like the southern wind so you know the the, the this character for the south and the wind and this kind of warm breeze, this warm breeze coming in from the south, basically, uh, it sounds like a weather report. Uh, but it's the, the the meaning behind it is the same wind that introduced Buddhism from India into China and then into Japan. And so, just looking at that, you're just like, oh yeah, that looks pretty. But once you actually kind of like get into it and you start to understand it, and all these different levels of understanding and appreciation come into it, these artistic 
endeavours start to become a lot more interesting. But as I said, a lot of this is, is difficult for, for, for Japanese to, to, to do now. I don't think that all Japanese people, if you ask most Japanese people to say, oh, what's the meaning of that? They're just like, oh, I don't know. Uh, and Mr. Kobayashi was very much sort of got some of the same. We had this one scroll. This was a, a you know, he, he kind of regularly used it. Um, and it's a, it's a Chinese poem. It's a Chinese song written on there. Uh, and he used to make up different meanings all the time. So we'd, he'd be showing sort of guests around uh, and he'd just make up these, these sort of different meanings because he knew that nobody could read it. Uh, it was a bit of, you know, a bit cheeky of him, but obviously one of the things even there with all of the, the objects that he had at his disposal, that we had at our disposal in order to kind of create displays, it's very, very difficult to create something that's perfect where all of these objects match, fit and work very well. So obviously he kind of used a little bit of artistic license. One of the things that we definitely know and appreciate in the West from the exhibit sort of style of, 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 of putting things out on display is the, the seasonality that can be represented by the accent plants and things like that. And one of the things that you sort of tend to see, particularly with the um, the, the more kind of artistic displays within the, the Tokonoma things, is uh, accents which represent the harshness of winter, which is something that we don't sort of tend to see too much. People think about uh, when we're creating accent plants is about trying to make it as gorgeous and as, as luscious as possible, but it's not always the case. Um, obviously, different seasons. This is a uh, you, know, you can see the Satsuki blooming there, uh, and so this having um, this sort of gorgeous, lush, uh, humid foliage in the in the in the spring, uh, in the summer is, is something really really good. But once we get into the winters, you wouldn't necessarily want that. But it's you know a very good way of creating some seasonal interest, try to find some flowers, accent plants, and things like that. If you want to see some of the best accent plants uh, in created in, in Europe, go and have a look at Mario Comster's Instagram page, uh, Bonsai Motor World. Some of the stuff that he's doing is just just phenomenal, and there are other people out there who are doing some really great great things. Um, and there is this kind of understanding of seasonality in reflecting all of the different seasons not just making it look really um bright and gorgeous i'm conscious of the time i'm going to sort of skip through there um there are other objects that get used in these types of displays that you may have sort of seen figurines stone suiseki won't really sort of talk about that too much um and brass objects and things like this these all have these ideas of seasonality they're all kind of representative of a certain scene uh, and so you'll sort of see snow covered huts you'll see uh, porcelain objects you know and they're using two completely different scenes uh, seasons so you know the snow things for the for, for, for the for the winter porcelain which is a cool looking um uh material uh would be used for for things in the summer so obviously you, you'll often see those with with suiseki displays and such like this uh and again some of those are the, the the objects and how they get used there is a certain amount of background knowledge in order to, to make them uh, have that deeper meaning uh, one object that we used to have we saw this uh, this this little figurine of a man um, and he was very much the, the go-to guy that we would that we would use for a lot of displays because it's just a very sort of simple way of filling that space and not making it feel quite so empty but also just bringing that sort of uh, the, the, the viewer's eye towards the main object. Okay, he was our go-to dude. Uh, other um, items that Mr. Kobayashi used particularly are uh, things like a no dance. This obviously has a much limited appeal, much limited use because of its uh, gorgeousness, the, the colours um, of, of the of the, the object. Uh, this, this monkey, which was a favourite one of mine, uh, he was a, a monk you know, a monkey dressed as a as a monk, uh, and that was a celebratory image uh, which would be used at New Year's, as we saw there. Uh, this was actually uh, a display that was generated that was created for the changing of the, the, the you know the the New Year until into the year of the monkey, uh, which was great fun. Uh, and then obviously, um, you know, objects which then helped to set the scene, giving a, a feeling of water. So we have a boat image there. Some, something similarly used there, the boat, the sea waves crashing up against the the the, the, um, the shore. And so all of these objects are used in order to try and create a certain feel. 
Okay, this is a stone, which again represents a boat. Uh, and again, there's ideas of um, the, the boat of fortune. There's all these kind of different uh, cultural ideas, which is going to take too long to go into it, all of them uh, going through. Uh, a lot of the figures that you will see uh, can be awfully lifelike. Um, and this is one from the uh, Kado book, uh, from Mr. Katayama. Uh, this is so realistic and lifelike that you would almost think it's going to jump off the, the page. But what you'll often see with a lot of the objects that the Japanese do use is they're not quite as realistic as this. Uh, and there's a lot of kind of like subtlety uh, amongst them. Uh, we've always sort of talked about the, the importance of the pots and the stands and things like that but one of the things that a lot of people perhaps miss out on just from looking at pictures is the quality and the importance of kind of using these antique pots as I sort of said trying to balance things up in terms of age very very kind of important to try and use aged pots in the in the Japanese display aesthetic um, because you're looking at creating this sort of cohesive um, uh, well-balanced image uh, and so using a one-year-old pot on a 500-year-old tree is not going to sort of create that nice calm balanced sort of type of image uh, and so one of the things that, that, that definitely is, is an important part of that sort of Japanese display aesthetic is the, the use of these um, aged pots uh, and one of the things that happens as I mentioned with the, the Kokofu aesthetic, is that a lot of those, um, the trees that get put into pots, are they're just in them for, for the show. A lot of them, are, as I mentioned, maybe too small for, for long-term cultivation, or perhaps the pot is, is, is way too valuable, um, uh, and or you know, because it, because of the rarity of it or something like that. Uh, and so we used to rent out pots specifically for um, just for, for the exhibit. Uh, so this was a, a, a pot which it was originally a Suiban. Uh, and so you can see the, the glaze is still on the inside. Holes were drilled um, because it was very difficult to, to find any large sized uh, pots um, that were unglazed. Uh, obviously trying to grow something where the inside of the pot is glazed is very very difficult. Um, I think, you know, water permeability and, and oxygen sort of coming through it makes it very very difficult um, for, for cultivation and so this was purely for exhibition purposes only uh, and that uh, that pot has won or has had cockafoo prize winning trees in it uh, a number of times and so there are the two the, the two trees that we sort of mentioned before but you know that idea of um, when you're looking at sort of creating displays either exhibit or the, the kind of like the tokonoma type of displays oh dear, sorry trying to, to to match up things in terms of age is, is is a really kind of important thing and you'll look at that and from a picture uh, and if you don't necessarily know a lot about pots it's very very difficult to kind of like see and feel how old and how impressive a lot of these antique pots are when you you, you might look at them in exhibits and just kind of walk past them if you don't know but there is a certain quality, a certain craftsmanship about a lot of these antique Chinese pots. I've got a stream on this in its entirety, which I've given a couple of times uh, as a talk. There is a certain texture, a certain quality that you can only kind of look and feel and touch and taste when you're looking at it in person. And that matches very, very well uh, when you're looking at kind of creating that balanced, aged uh, appearance. And that's why a lot of those those pots of, uh, get used. Looking at the importance of the stand um, within a display, either exhibit or tokonoma type displays, it's one of the most kind of like intrinsic parts of creating an image. I know we sort of talk about all of these other things being intrinsic. It's very very important, um, and a lot more important than a lot of people give kind of sort of credit for. Uh, colour, the size of the stands, how simple or ornate they are, all of the material of them, all are very, very uh, kind of um, important aspects. Uh, and a lot of them are custom built to, specifically to order. Uh, when going back to the kind of like the Meiji period and, and the, the sort of the start of bonsai display and things like that, when you're looking at the, the, the original stands that were getting built for bonsai, uh, a lot of the um, famous bonsai nurseries would approach um, furniture makers, cabinet makers. Uh, to, to kind of create um, 
stands to, to display their trees on because they didn't exist. Um, and the first sort of sets of stands that were, were, were coming back were these massive, really sturdy, um, solid, uh, ugly looking stands, uh, which were aesthetically just, just awful. Uh, and so they had to sort of go back to them and say, okay, we need this to be lighter. We need this to be, uh, you know, a certain kind of like femininity. We need this to be masculine. We need this to be ornate. We need this to be these sizes rather than this big, thick, heavy utilitarian piece that you've that you've created. Uh, this is a stand that was made by uh, a copy um, that was made by Mr. Katayama you know a copy of some of those earlier designs and things like that and that that idea is still kind of like being being done today and so the the importance of the stands as I sort of said earlier is um with the big heavy juniper is important so for for real sort of heavy trees you know the the, the heavy stands actual sort of both visually and sort of sturdy enough for them to not kind of like collapse under their own weight uh are being used and one of the reasons for this is it, you know the idea with a lot of the, 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 the displays and things as mentioned is about this kind of relationship between the, 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 the viewer and the and the, the objects that's being sort of displayed. If a stand is too weak looking, the, the viewer is just going to look at it and think that stand's about to break. It's just a natural kind of human reaction. And when we look at cascade stands, it also sort of, there's an element of that. But here we see a very sort of strong and powerful, impressive, muscular looking, masculine stand, which is perfectly matched to that big and heavy powerful tree we see levels of ornateness to give added um, layers of interest to, to, to a display which is pretty boring in terms of the tree as an azalea yeah. but also the height of, of trees uh, as they're being displayed is, is a very sort of important aspect to, to sort of consider and so uh, obviously this Broom style Zolkova, kind of a lowland parkland type image uh, being displayed there. Very, very low. The moon image high up in the sky. This is a beautiful, very subtle, beautiful sort of, uh, display image. And then the, the, the concept of the, the height really sort of comes into play when we're looking at sort of cascade style trees. And this is one area that you quite often see um, mistakes being made because it's a very fine line. Uh, between it being sort of too stable or too sort of disturbing, uh, so this is one which uh, which uh, kind of achieves that very very uh, really quite well. So we've got that added height to the to, to, to the tree, so we get all of this space underneath. So we definitely feel the wind blowing, that we feel this cascading off the side of a mountain. And we don't feel as though it's going to topple over anytime soon, but there's a certain amount of kind of instability due to the inward curving legs. The base being slightly smaller than the, the the top of the tree there so there's that slight sense of instability when we look at this there's no sense of drama there's no sense of of kind of like the tree being in a, in a very dramatic looking place very dangerous okay and equally if the tree is too on on, on, a, on a stand that is too delicate then you're worried about walking past it in case the whole thing topples over some of these root stands, the exposed root stands that we see, this is the the, the most kind of easy to you know visualize image of you know where the tree is then growing into the the roots coming out of the bottom of the of the of the pot, clasping on it gives that the the movement within those root stands um, is is of great importance. Uh, the sort of the the orientation that the the, the artist when they're creating the the display has chosen specifically to to in order to to get that. The, the eye of the of the viewer sort of coming up and into the space um, is, is you know, th these things are chosen with with, with great kind of uh, intention. Uh, not all root stands are, are great. Obviously, this one being sort of super heavy, uh, you know the 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 thickness of the root stand here is actually thicker than the trunk of the tree, and so obviously that fails. Uh, one aspect of Japanese aesthetics that, that comes into this um, is uh, kind of a, the use of materials and things like that. Uh, bamboo, when we see a lot of bamboo stands, this is something that would be used exclusively within the Japanese kind of display aesthetics and ideas. Uh, it should be within the summer months. A lot of these stands are very delicate uh, and easily broken. Um, and 
we unfortunately, uh, they, they some of them got broken. Um, uh, at Mr. Kobayashi's just little bits kind of like come out, uh, and it's very difficult to to find any kind of like good modern um, uh, examples of stands because the the craftsmen today just don't have the same ability to to sort of create them. Uh, and so a lot of these stands now um, are very very sort of highly prized. They they always have been just because of the the difficulty of the the kind of the creation of them. Uh, but they would always be kind of like used within a, a, a sort of a summer type of um, display. Uh, and then we would go into looking at the opposite end of it, where you're sort of looking at the one of the reasons why a lot of them, uh, a lot of the stands are kind of like very heavy, sort of uh, dark colours, uh, is because a lot of the, the displays are kind of like held during the winter. Um, and also to, to, to take away any sort of potential distraction so you know if you if the, the you know these pieces of wood are really beautiful pieces of wood uh, but if we were able to see too much um uh sort of patterning on them uh, it makes them a lot less um easy to use it requires a you know trees of equal kind of like caliber of character in order to to, to balance things up okay uh, this is this is very sort of successful as a as, as a as a pairing because of the informality of both the tree uh, and the stand there. Okay, right. So we are really dragging on. I knew this was going to happen because uh, I do have a tendency to waffle on. So the fundamental principles behind the um, the we'll, we'll just sort of go through uh, the creation of these sort of types of displays is to try and find balance between objects. And so clearly here, uh, this was a um, uh, the balance of this uh, of this display here is clearly weighted in favour of the scroll and this was a, a display that was created in order not the scroll the picture in order to to sell that picture this was a uh, exhibit for um, a gallery selling the, the works of this uh, calligrapher looking at the relative positions and things like this the relative sizes between these two objects are terrible based based on the space it's too large to be clo that close to the tree. The eye goes towards the accent a lot more. Here, this looks at first glance as to be a very, very nice uh, and beautiful kind of um, uh, a display. Nicely balanced, the size, the flow of all of the objects, the direction of things looks really nice. The tree flowing into the space, the bird coming into the into the tree. This nice heavy stone here as a as a kind of a, a weighty full stop to, to hold all the, all of those objects together but we've got different seasons uh, at play here uh, we've got a winter image uh, on the scroll uh, you can't sort of see it because there's, there's um, snow on, on of sort of falling on there uh, we have a summer image summer summer object with the with the stand there uh, and then this stone is red and autumnal Here we go with seasonality being kind of like repeated. The sparseness of, of, of these, uh, of, all, of all the objects here is, uh, makes it very kind of, you, you, it's not being, things aren't being uh, accentuated to, to, to the sort of the height, the, the, as much as it could be. Uh, you feel very cold looking at this as, a, as an image, even though it is in winter. The repetition of the the kind of like the the, the twigginess of the of the tree uh, and the accent plant there. The thickness of the of the the, the, the uprights on the table making the, the 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 twigs the the branches look very thin. All these things are kind of detracting from the from that main object. So actually trying to 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 achieve a nice kind of like well balanced harmonious display with very few objects is actually really quite difficult and so when it does go, when it does work and things do kind of like go in, in, in harmony it really does uh, kind of uh, look very very beautiful uh, the direction of trees and the direction of objects is something that a lot of people have uh, have a lot of sort of difficulty with, uh, and this is something that we're definitely sort of covering in in a sort of stream all by itself. Uh, and this is one tree that Mr. Kobayashi and I always used to sort of fight over because 
Um, I always used to think of the, the direction of the tree coming from the, the Nabari up through the trunk and then into the apex, oh dear. Uh, whereas he was always looking at the, that sort of first branch. Uh, and obviously with him being my teacher, I'd always have to, to kind of um, go with whatever he said. But I always used to kind of like put it over on this side of the, the Tokonoma uh, for a display and, and just see how it, it, it worked. Uh, but yes, when sort of talking about the kind of I mentioned it at the start, the the idea of the the direction and the flows of of of, um, of trees and objects and things like that, it isn't until you actually sort of start to put them together that you actually really begin to realise how important it is within the designs of your trees when you're making them to 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 kind of real sort of capture that. Um, that sort of sense of, of, of direction so here obviously the things are the wrong way around and this is from that very early period of, of, of bonsai display and so clearly they would be looking at that and thinking well you know, anybody with any sort of artistic sense would, would have looked at that and think something here doesn't quite work and obviously kind of like then sort of move things around and so the, the act of display enables the, the, the kind of the, um, the progression of um, of the art form basically Okay, we'll skip through a few of these pictures here. Uh, the, the sort of the viewpoint is a, is a is an important thing. So one thing that a lot of people have difficulty with um, is knowing how high the uh, the the you know trees are going to be viewed at. Uh, and so um, you know sort of traditionally uh, the, within the Tokonoma, uh, you know, with them being down on the ground, they're not designed to be viewed at from above, uh, but rather sort of kneeling down you know, in front of them. And so all of those sorts of um, images that you see of, of Tokonoma displays are supposed to be viewed with uh, with not from a standing position such as within the, the, the exhibits but from, from kneeling down. Uh, there's food on display. Uh, uh, okay so when we're looking at the, these displays and sort of trying to, 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 to put across a meaning this is where the kind of like the, the real artistry uh, sort, of, sort of comes in where you're really tr trying to uh, to, to, to kind of like put forward a, a feeling or a message from, from the artist to your viewer. And this really, as I said, once we get into that sort of tokonoma type display area um, and the, you know, the, the use of those different objects where they can have deeper meaning, um, it really sort of comes into, in, into play. But a lot of it does depend on the empathy of both and the ed and education of the, of the viewer as well as the artist and so putting out those um you know those those sort of kado type displays they you know those, those exhibits that they would put on wouldn't be open to the general public just to sort of come in and traipse through and say oh that looks pretty you know it was designed for to have um you know to, to be viewed by people who had that education and who had that deeper sort of level of understanding and could appreciate that this had that much more kind of uh, cultural meaning and things like that. Okay, uh, we are getting on a bit here, so I think we're just going to sort of skip this bit here, going through there. Um, right, one of the things that uh, is very kind of something that I really, really kind of have a bugbear about it with um, with displays is the kind of like the, the the placement on on tables and things like that. And this is one area where you can, even within a, a an exhibit type situation, you can play around and get a little bit more kind of artistry within that sort of um, quite formalised and stylized place. And one of the things that the recent trends are to always kind of like put the tree directly on the centre of the stand and that the table should always be square to the viewer and that there's nothing else on the table. Right? These, this is basically how it has become, but it hasn't always been that way. And so one thing that, you, that, that can be done and has always been done within uh, sort of uh, Japanese display practices is off-center positions on stands. It doesn't work all the time. It only works in certain sort of situations, but definitely within this, um, uh, within this display here, just giving that extra little bit of space underneath there really helps with the flow of... The, the the tree, you know that, that sort of windswepty type feel, having that extra sort of space underneath there. If that pot was placed right on the edge here, it would look very strange because all of the the space would be behind it. And so when you have a limited number of stands, when you have a limited resources available to you, there are possibilities uh, to, to to kind of play around with 
positioning of stands, good positioning of the, the pot on the on the, on top of the stand to enable you to do that. And this is something that I really like doing. Uh, this is a tree that I got created earlier this year, uh, where I definitely looked at doing that. And so on this Shin uh, Jita, this is a, a black lacquer Jita. This wasn't placed directly in the centre, but deliberately off centre, both back and left to right. Okay, and so giving yourself that extra sort of space in there enables you to have that little bit extra bit of artistry and things like that. So this is something that I just want to put out there and, and, and talk about. And this is something that has, as I said, always been practiced. And if you did it today, it doesn't always work, but it's definitely a way of playing around with all of the objects that you have at your disposal. Okay. One thing about uh, creating displays and things like that, a lot of people are looking for rules and regulations and things like that. There are no rules. This is this is where it becomes an art, and so it's the interpretation of the viewer, it's the interpretation of the artist that, that comes into, into play. Obviously, when we're looking at trying to create something which is culturally uh, correct, which fits into a larger framework of the Japanese culture, then there needs to be that understanding that the scroll that we, that we showed with the southerly wind coming in gets displayed at the start of the summer in May okay uh, and the other thing is to is to do things kind of like from a from a sense of, uh, of feel rather than from a sense of being mechanical and so that kind of the using of the tape measure there you see people getting really kind of like obsessive about it this is where you kind of like just have to sort of step back and look at things and try and bring that sense of kind of uh, humanity into it rather than it become a, a mechanical process and so this is the last little section that we're going to sort of talk about uh, and this is something which you know some of the ideas that we've talked about in terms of uh, bonsai particularly as um, to like push it as an art form is um, it's, it kind of like sort of comes into it and like the, the how bonsai gets displayed going forward we are kind of like in the West looking at trying to make things uh, a lot more relevant to the audience in terms of cultural geography and things like that, representing the images that are around us and things like that. Um, and so thinking about these ideas when, when we are as, as non-Japanese practitioners of bonsai uh, is something that's very important. Uh, Ryan's doing some great ideas over... Um, uh, bonsai mirai and using some really interesting sort of stands uh, and, and spaces and things like that the artisan's cup was was, was a sort of a groundbreaking kind of aspect to that um that's not to say that doing you know the, the traditional japanese thing in the west is, is 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 a bad thing at all I, as i said earlier there's no right or wrong it's just if you're going to do it japanese just do it correctly you know put the study in to understand the importance of scrolls don't have your scrolls hanging in in such a way that shows uh, an ignorance of this, uh, of, of of those ideas and the and the and the concepts. It's about putting effort in, about studying what you're doing and considering it from a perspective of um, of an art form, rather than just kind of like doing things mechanically and going through the motions. Uh, and that idea and that effort um, needs to sort of, sort of spread to the other aspects of of, of the the display, not just the tree but also the pot uh, and tables accessories and all this kind of things it says their money must be spent if you want the, the you know to, to push it up to the finest then you're going to have to be asking you know specific stands to be made by people uh, and, and, and this idea uh, and things like that um, but that's not to say that you can't do things in your own home in your own space with and have that sort of playful aspect to it okay um, it doesn't have to be something which is you know, like super expensive. It's got to be enjoyable. It's got to be fun. It's got to be kind of like artistic. It's got to be taking the the, the appreciation of bonsai to um, a deeper level. Uh, and whether that's European style, whether that's American style, whatever style you want to talk about, whatever names you want to be a, t talking about it, as long as all of those sort of fundamental principles, as long as the fundamental principles, because what we were talking about in terms of things like uh, the, the balance between objects, the space between objects, these are just basic design principles. You know, as long as those sort of things remain true, then it's going to be exactly the same as the kind of the Japanese way of, of, of displaying it, but just culturally slightly different. And so trying to experiment with, it, with other ideas is something which is definitely something which is 
being done in Japan and being done and should be done elsewhere. There was a piece of text which I found, which is really, really good. Um, and reading through it is very kind of interesting. And you would say sort of guess the sort of publication date of it on this. Uh, and the text sort of says, the bonsai is a single work of art, so the exhibiting and viewing of such must be relevant to the location and the circumstances. It must be modern. It must be suitable for modern lifestyles. It goes on to sort of talk about the existing display methods being uh, designed to please scholars and such like you know, displaying it in a tokonoma this is from a japanese text as well this isn't any western text or anything like that taking the trouble to stay within the rules and maintain balance and harmony between objects is very difficult and troubling uh, and then it goes on to talk about all these other diff different ideas that are in the, the ikebana world and such like um but the you know the, the this idea was being written about by in a, in, a, in a bonsai magazine by a, a, a well-known bonsai um, enthusiast professional uh, who was talking about modernising bonsai display, talking about taking it away from the traditions and things like this uh, because to, to take it away from uh, towards a younger generation. Uh, to show them the beauty and the majesty of the natural world displayed in a relevant way. Now, so this was in Japanese text. These ideas, this concept was being written about in 1958. So even more than 50 years ago now, people there were people sort of pushing there for a more modern interpretation of bonsai. And we're kind of like, we've, we've been talking about this for the last 10, 15 years, and people have been trying things and trying to, change and evolve new ideas and it is this constantly uh, evolving aspect of, of bonsai how, how they get displayed and there's no right and there's no wrong what people were doing back in the 1930s is completely ridiculous now what people are doing you know it's just it's just trying to find that like sort of common thread taking those ideas which are which have been tried and tested and, and have a you know that the, the are the foundation of bonsai uh, and looking at them from, a, from from different ideas and things like that. So that is basically it. Uh, I tried to keep it under two hours, and I just about have. Um, there are some uh, questions in uh, in in the chat, I think. Um, but uh, the only question I will answer is: When displaying a tree inside, I'm talking about how long can a tree be kept inside without suffering? It depends on the season. It depends on the tree. Uh, usually, no more than a week. Um, right, so, oh, wait a minute, I need to change it so it's me. I'm absolutely knackered now, here we go. Right, there we go. Uh, so, uh, that was uh, basically a kind of a really, uh, I believe the term is a deep dive into um, the sort of the, the history and the kind of like the, the way of doing, the way in which sort of the Japanese bonsai display ideas and, and practices have kind of like come into being. Um, and uh, kind of some of the important aspects of it. So when you're looking at the, those um, displays now, some of the, the, the concepts, and, and you're looking at the tokonomas and things like that, you've got a bit more of a, an idea about what's going on, a bit more of an idea about where it's come from, um, and particularly when you look then looking at kind of ex exhibits and things like that, might give you a bit of an idea of why certain things have been chosen from, from, from the Japanese perspective. Right, uh, as I said previously, these streams are free. Uh, they're out there on YouTube for people to, to look at. Uh, I've just put up a um, donation link. If you found to be of, any, of, of great use to you, please donate. The link will also be on the text underneath. Um, it would be nice to, 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 you know, to continue doing these. Uh, I find it quite difficult to, to bounce everything up at the moment. Um, but uh, the donations and appreciation is uh, greatly uh, received. Um, and I think that's probably about it. The only other thing to say is uh, congratulations to the chair boys. Um, those of you who may notice, I am wearing a Wickham Wanderers football shirt. Uh, the mighty Wickham thrashed Fleetwood Town uh, last night 4-1 in the first leg of the playoffs. Uh, so we are almost certainly on our way to Wembley and the championship, which is just crazy talk. Um, and 
This stream has been brought to you in association with, with Guinness. Enjoy a nice pint now. Poured out, the glass has become too, uh, a little bit warm. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna enjoy this. I've been chatting nonstop for two hours. Uh, thank you all for, for sitting through it. Uh, and I'll see you again on the next stream whenever that